So welcome to weird shit in real estate. Let's have some fun. All right. So you so, want to work with Jay Z or the Island Boys? <laughs> well, that, that cracks me up. So, uh, okay, this is the bullshitter. Okay, when you get this phone call, they immediately tell you you're an investor. Christy's been through this before. You've all had this phone call. They're like, "I'm an investor." They only ask to see off market properties. They only ask to see some things that are already sold. They ask you about auction. They tell you they're paying in cash. They, they tell you that they work with several agents. Well, what happened to those other agents? Why aren't they working with them? Um, they make reference to the make-believe list that we all hide. You know, the, you know that one. All that one we save for ourselves yeah. off yep. market. So, Scott, you got anything yep. on these? Nope. On the financial side of no, this? No, so this is an investor. Look, trying, yes. Trying so to you always property. have to be careful. With this, especially when we have those conferences come in town where, you know, they're like, oh, invest with other people's money. Like, this is great. And then you get a bunch of people that watch some YouTube videos and then they think that they're going to go invest with other people's money. What they're trying to do is they're trying to wholesale. They're not actually trying to invest. Not all yeah. wholesalers are bad. They're just a pain in our ass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a few good ones. But are they real? Once you get through all those questions and you find out like, hey, you know what? This person might actually know what they're talking about. What kind of financing are they using? Is it a buy and hold? What are they looking for? Are they trying to flip? How many have they done before? If they're not willing to sign a buyer broker, if they're like, oh, bring me a property and then I'll sign it, just walk away because what they're going to do is they're going to look up the tax record and they're going to go directly to the owner. It happens every single time. Yeah. Um, you, like, is what they're asking for realistic? If they have $50,000 and want to spend $50,000 in cash, are you going to be able to find them a property for $50,000 in this market? No, no, not even in an auction. No, nope. these people are cutting their noses off to spite their faces. If they're only interested in off market properties, you don't really want to waste your time with them. You know, are they a contractor? Who are they working with? Do they have a team? Do they know what a cap rate is? You guys don't get this whole thing. All right. This is where Scott comes in. Okay. By the numbers. Um, where, do you want, where do you want to begin? Mm. Um, wherever you want. I mean, the cost for a new build is ground up. Cost to contractor. Not the cost to the consumer, but the cost to the contractor right now is about $110 a square foot. For a consumer for a renovation project, consumer cost is about two hundred and sixty dollars a square foot for renovation right now. Yeah, those numbers are accurate. And what I'm what I'm looking for, if they have experience, is all I need is ten percent down plus closing cost. Um, if no experience, twenty percent down. So, it most lenders are going to be the same, and it just takes money to it takes money to make money in this business. As you guys know, anybody looking for 100% financing, I wouldn't even waste your time with, with any investor like that. So capital is is key here. And um, I'm looking for 10% down. And, we, and uh, what I asked for was a bank statement showing, you know, the 10% down plus another 10% to get the project started. So the first thing I do, the first thing I do when I get a deal or a potential deal is I try to kill it. If I can't kill it inside five minutes, you know, then there's probably a deal there. And, and the questions I ask are, um, how much capital do you have to work with? What's your credit score? Uh, property address, what are the numbers? What's the purchase price, the rehab and the resale amount? I, you give me those factors and I'll tell you right, right there if you have a deal or not. Um, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of the investors like you see from California or, or online, you know, you don't forget you're talking to sales salespeople there. So there, it's always going to be a yes, yes, yes. You just send me the package, send me the package. And you end up wasting your time. Um, there's really, the only way to vet, you know, a, a good lender is I would only go with somebody local and I uh, check references. Um, so, you know, I, I just see, I, I hear nightmare stories constantly about these uh, 
these huge lenders out of town. And the bigger the lender is, the, you know, the more headache it is because they're they're bulking and selling those loans. And the underwriting is just it's it's pain in the ass. You, you know, no other no other way to put it. Um, so I'm, I'm here with Chrissy just to I'm here to answer you guys' questions. So and there's no such thing as a stupid question, you know, especially for new investors. So don't hesitate to ask me anything. And please feel free to unmute yourselves and chime in. Yep. This is kind of a question and answer session because we all get these phone calls every time there's a new YouTube video by somebody, you know, of you can invest for $15,000. Like you can buy a million dollar Airbnb property with $15,000. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. And I, question. Yeah, yes, of course. Um, I sent a, a property to a, an investor a few days ago, and he says, oh, I need to know, because the property was in process to be remodeled, and they stopped the, the, re the renovation. So my investor, I sent the pro property to him, and he says, um, does the property has uh, permits? Are the permits open? And he asked me so many questions, and I was thinking, I don't think this is my, my job. Um, it is your job if you are going to work with an investor and if you want to find out if the permits are open or if they've been closed properly. And again, this goes back to like when you're doing, even when you're doing purchases and you know, a home has been flipped, you as part of the due diligence for your buyer, you need to call the city and find out what permits are on file. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, with with investment properties and when with rehabs and even new construction, you you as as the listing agent or the buyer's agent, you need to get your hands a little dirty and you got to ask those tough questions. Just like those were excellent questions that that investor or potential investor asked you. It's key because you know you you don't want to go you don't want to have a property that that was just rehabbed and go to closing and then and then the home inspection kills it. And what what, what could kill it is one, the work is done poorly, or two, they never pulled permits, so nobody was really checking the work other than the lender or, or the borrower themselves. So never hesitate to ask those tough questions as far as permits, who did the work, uh, permits closed, open, you know, et cetera. Those are all excellent questions. Donnie's a good one to speak on that because um, he did one this past August and um, none of the permits were pulled. And we were within within the 90 days, and I'll go over the 90 day rule, but we were within the 90 days and none of the permits had been pulled. And I asked, and my title company is experienced enough with this to ask, where are the permits? The lender wanted the permits because we were with, with inside that 90 days. They wanted the permits. They had to, we ended up delaying closing by what was it, Donnie, like two weeks? Yeah, it was like two weeks because they, um, because they didn't want to go get the permits. Yeah. So any job, if they're if they're moving a wall or moving the kitchen, um, any any major rehab, you know, I, I make them get a permit um, just because of this this reason. You know, you get to the home inspection and the and you lose the deal because the home inspection fails. So if, if you're at, if there's ever any question or, or you're hesitant about a property that was just rehab, just go ahead and order a home inspection before you even list it. That way, you know, you're ahead of the, any problems. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes it's just best not to know. <laughs> From our perspective, it's I, best I not to know. Yeah. From your perspective. From my perspective, yeah. I don't like, I don't like a deal being killed due to the home inspection. That's all. No, nobody likes that. But again. You need to, you know, if you're going to work with these investors, you need to encourage them to do these correctly, to pull the permits that need to be pulled. It is not that hard. It is not that difficult. I understand that sometimes you have to wait on a permit. That's just part of the business. Yeah. Like you have to build those things into your carry. So. And permits are, they're cheap. So you know, I, 500, 500 bucks for a building permit. Yep. So again, you know, like, and then of course on a flip, like on a standard flip, especially if it's being financed, you are looking for that hundred thousand dollar spread because there is going to be 
10% of unknowns because it is constructions. There's 10% of unknowns, but you also have, you know, your 3%, the buyer's agent, 3%, the possibility of paying closing costs. You have to account for losing 10% off the top of your ARV, which brings you down plus the construction costs, plus the, um, plus the uh, renovation. Where is the money to be made? A hundred thousand dollars spread on something that needs about, you know, forty five thousand dollars worth of renovation leaves your person making approximately thirty thousand dollars. The flip has to be worth it. I actually worked with um, an investor and still currently working, did eight properties in the past almost two years um, from listing them. Some of them I kind of subcontract, did the subcontract, meaning um, finding contractors, you know, getting them all uh, doing the work and permits and stuff. And they did tell me, yes, absolutely, 100,000. So they always gave me the number 70% or lower yeah. um, of, of their purchase. So say a $200,000 house, they won't pay any more than 140. Um, of course, with me saying, you know, that the, the home can sell in the 240, 260 range. So um, absolutely. And now I think it's even more because of the unknown of cost of material and such. So it's almost it's even going to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's been brutal. Like if you, if, if you have, and you can bring along a baby investor as long as they're willing to do the work. And as long as they're willing to listen to the things that you like, you have to be the expert in this all the way through. So everyone knows what the 90 day rule is. Yes. Do you guys? No. Okay. So the 90 day rule is if you list that house inside of 90 days, FHA will not look at it. Um, conventional, you can get away with it. Uh, VA, there is a workaround, but you're going to have to get lien releases from everybody that worked on that property, and, which can be really difficult. Contractors are kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, it's like herding cats. So um, you can get around that 90 day rule, but honestly, it's best to just wait till the 91st day because then title's not going to get pulled for another two weeks. You're not going to have this problem. However, in this market, because it's so hot, we have been seeing the 180 day rule come up, which is specific to FHA. So if a house, so let's say, again, say you worked with a lot of contracts. So if, if a house is making 100% profit, so let's say your contractor buy, or your, your investor buys it for 100000 does $30,000 worth of work, and then sells it for or $280,000, they've now made 100% profit. If they've made 100% profit, FHA, if you're selling it inside of that 180 days, FHA is going to require two appraisals because they have to justify that price increase or the lending lender will not lend. And that, that all goes back to 2007 when, when prices yeah. were inflated in the market just tanked. So that's why that rule is in place. Just FYI. Okay. And then of course, does their lender require an appraisal? I know Scott here requires appraisals because even though we, I give, Scott, my numbers, like yep. these are my ARVs and Scott knows that I'm good at my ARVs. They, I still have to have an appraisal to back it up. Yeah. So um, I'll even close the deal without an appraisal. I just closed the last two without appraisals. I mean, we, we got, <laughs> no, 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 let me finish. No, um, they're experienced investors. They had, they had capital to put down. We still order the appraisal. Like with these, we got them after the fact. Because we're selling these loans, so we we can't. We're going to need an appraisal to uh, quote unquote check the box. So yeah, I do require appraisal on, on every deal. And Who are you selling these loans to, Scott? <laughs> that's a, that's a business uh, <laughs> thing I can't talk about. And um, they also um, the lender I worked with with his hard money. Um, they required um, several appraisal inspections through some of the processes before releasing the next. Um, batch of money right so you're talking about like because because that 20 percent down 
is the purchase price plus the renovation. So it's 20% of the conglomeration of that. And they get progress payments from that portion that is reserved for the construction portion of it. But somebody has to come in and inspect that work from the lender and make sure that it's done properly in order to release those funds. Yeah. So before we release a draw, so if you're buying a house for a hundred grand and, you, and there's 50,000 of rehab, um, we hold that 50,000 in escrow or we call it hold money. And that's just for the repairs and we release it as the work's being completed. So what I tell a new client is, you know, we're not an ATM. So, the, you know, what the draw is no less than $10,000. So they do $10,000 for work and material and labor. Uh, I, either I have them send me pictures of the work done or I'll go out personally or I'll send somebody out and, and inspect it. And then upon that, we release the draw. So, yeah, th there's a, we know any time during the project if there's going to be if we see any problems or foresee any problems as the as the draws are being released. So. Oh, wait, how do you. <clears throat> Hi, this is Miriam Lily. How do you know. How do you determine there's going to be a problem? What type of problems arise that causes causes you to say, wait a minute, there's a problem here. I'm not really. Well, fun. well again, and we try to eliminate this in the beginning of the loan, but but problems that do occur are, hey, you, you know, a proper termite wasn't wasn't uh, done before the before they closed on it. And all of a sudden you need to repair a bunch of floor joists and that could be anywhere from eight to fifteen thousand dollars. That's that's a big problem. And because, you're gonna have to carry it alone because yeah. you did not account for it inside of your so like when you do these loans, you get paperwork to do and you set up and tell the lender, I'm going to get, I'm going to put this much in the budget for um, paint, this much in the budget for electrical, this much in the budget for plumbing and like, and it's not the finish, it's the rough end stuff. And you have to divide up your money very carefully and decide how you want your draws to come out. Exactly. So I'm, I'm getting an itemized list basically of the budget, um, you know, that list is going to be, it's broken down basically to room by room. So if you do open up the floors and find out there's damage down there, you know, that that's not on me. That's on, that's on the, whoever bought the house. They should have had that, the, the should have had it inspected properly. Same thing goes with the, with the roof, you know, you get up in the attic and all of a sudden you find out there's major roof repair that weren't accounted for in the budget. That's not going to be on me. That's going to be on my client to come out of pocket with, with extra money. And that I'm not saying I haven't um, amended budgets before because I have. There's, there's unforeseen circumstances that always arise on any flip. And I'll go ahead and, and bump the budget, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. If it was a good, honest, honest mistake that nobody accounted for, even me as a lender looking at it. So, you know, we're here, I'm here to work. I'm here to make sure you succeed. So no lender ever wants to take a property back. No lender ever wants to foreclose. So I'm in the, you know, the way I look at it, I'm in this, we're partners in this deal. I'm going to make sure everything's done right. I'm going to make sure you don't fail. Well, and like it, it's construction. It, Murphy's law has struck. Yeah. You just yep. don't know where. Yep. You haven't found it yet. Are a hard money lender or are you a lender? I, I, I'd like to say private lender, private, private money lender, lender. <laughs> because I'm, I'm cheaper than, than most out there. Um, actually, I think I'm the cheapest out there right now. Yeah. And I'm not just saying that. I'm not just blowing smoke. Here. No, it is true. I have worked with multiple hard money lenders before. I've worked with some guys out of Richmond. I've worked with Finance Company of Commercial, uh, Finance Company of America Commercial. Oh, that's a story. Um. Yeah. And some of these people are really difficult to work with. I am not going to lie. Like it is brutal. Like there's a guy out of Richmond. I'm not going to name names because there's a couple of them up in Richmond, but I mean, by the day, like these guys are losing thousands of dollars a day on these carry costs. Yeah. So a lot of the hard money, quote unquote lenders, you know, they're, they're doing four month, six month terms. Those are balloon notes, meaning, meaning they're due in four to six months. Um, and the, the reason they do that is number one is they want the job. They, they want to turn the money. Like my investors, yeah, they want to see the money turn. 
but they also are planning on you going longer. So if you have a six month note, you need an extension, you know, they're, that's when they really stick it to you. Oh yeah. And yeah. And it's, and it's painful. It hurts. So I don't, I, I write my minimum notes a year long, you know, and, and my rates are anywhere from five, nine, nine to, to eight, nine, nine percent in the points. Um, are anywhere from two and a half to four, depending on the difficulty of the deal and the experience. So your first deal, you know, for every deal you do with me, you do, everything gets lower, the rate and the points. So if you, if you get a four month or six month note and you find out your investor is using that lender that's right in that four month or six month note, you know, just be aware of that. And just be aware that, you know, that property, they start foreclosing after six months or, you know, again, in their defense, mm-hmm. I understand where they're coming from. They're just more expensive than me. And they're looking at you to go longer. And that's where they make their, their really serious money. Hey. Yeah. hey. Yep. Um, so I've heard you, I've, I'm reading what are the carry costs and I've heard you guys mention it two or three times, but can you give me like a definition of what carry costs are? So your, your carrying costs are basically your, the interest you're paying on the money you borrow for the for the loan if, if there obviously there's cash or cash buyers there's there's no carrying cost but you it's just it's that's just interest closing costs and and points so basically. everyone that came here is gonna get my calculator that i created on um excel um and you can adjust it to the specific loan type that your investor is doing and it will pump you out a number for exactly what their profit is going to be exactly what the carry cost is it has a separate table over to the side where it breaks down exactly what it is per month and it will also break it down by the day because i can tell you that on some of these you know my investors are paying if you break it down by the day it's a hundred dollars a day to carry it like and it, it is no matter what you do it is not it is not three months everybody's like oh it's three months it's not because we need 30 days to close. Yeah. It's four months. Like. I, I get uh, a lot of calls I get are, hey, what if I, you know, what if I close in, in two or three months? You know, am I paying interest on the full year, which is an absolute no. You're, you're, it's like a credit card. You're only paying it as whatever you use and how long you use it. So, and I, I can't tell you how many times I get an investor coming in, like, I'll be in and out of this in 60 days or 45 days. And man, nine, I think one guy, I think the past year actually did turn it around in 90 days. Every single, I don't care if it's $30,000 mm-hmm. budget or $20,000 budget, it's all four to six months. Yeah. You know, barring a miracle, like that one client out of the probably the hundred loans we closed last year. Well, and, and it really just depends on the permitting process. I know that during COVID, like at one point we waited 12 weeks for a permit and then when they were going to do inspections, you had to empty the entire house. So you were losing an entire day and a half worth of work, you know, of production, because in order to inspect the rough ends, they gave you a window of two days that no one could be in that house. So. Yeah. And I, and I heard some, one of you guys mentioned that you were helping the, the client sub out for contractors, et cetera. You know, and, and my, and, Chrissy will do this for, for me a lot with a new new investors that don't have um, don't have contractors. But I'm telling you, if you're if you find yourself doing that, you make sure you're getting paid for it. So if you're if you were listening for two percent, you can tell them I'll, I'll I'll help you. But you know it's full three percent. I don't get out of bed yeah. for less than three percent. Yeah. So <laughs> just don't short sell yourself. <laughs> sorry, yeah. sorry. I'll, 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 I'll be honest. I'll be honest. Can you mute it? No, it's no, no, no. Let me say. I like, actually got, uh, you know, I mean, I know we're not supposed to talk about numbers, but I got 4%. It, it, yeah. It's and a you, lot of work. Like, yeah. I did not you discount know. myself. It's no. unbelievably how many I had to interview fire, fire oh, after okay. they got their initial deposits and work wasn't being done. And I had to, with, with a team of five investors, they're one owner under five and five owners. Oh God! So it you. was a job. Um, I'm gonna get to I Don- a lot. I learned a lot. Yes, I'm gonna get to Donnie's question in a second too. Um, so and again, 
when you're doing this, most of these people have LLCs, you have to have their stamped articles of incorporation. And a lot of times they don't want to share them with you. And if they are not willing to share them with you and give you stamped articles of incorporation, walk away. Yeah, they're going to need them at the table. Exactly. Because anyway. you're never going to get to closing. Yeah, I require that before, before closing. So the first thing I ask for from a client, you know, a recent bank statement, your, your LLC docs, Yep. Including an operating agreement. A lot of a lot of people forget that. There needs to be an operating agreement included in the, those docs. Um, and you know, the whole the termite report. That's pretty much all I'm looking for up front in and when I underwrite a deal. Anyone that is wondering what stamped articles incorporation means is they are the it is the entirety of the LLC laid out, including the operating agreement that has been filed with the State Corporation Commission, has gotten their stamp of approval and has come back. So every single page is stamped by state the State Corporation Commission. That is what you want to see. If they cannot provide that, they need to go get it before you can do anything for them. They have to sign a buyer broker. They have to, if you're doing this, I don't want the commission on an $80,000 house. I want it on the $280,000 house. I have a contract that if you guys are serious about working with investors, I have a contract outside of Keller Williams with my investors. Excellent. They belong to me. I had an attorney draft it. I have one quick question concerning your, your ability for financing on what you're willing to do for your, what you offer. So sure. uh, a lot of these properties that these flippers, these investors are looking for are auction. Certainly yep. you can't even go in the property. You can't look at it. You can't walk the property. Otherwise you're trespassing. So, That's right. how do, Not. so, so again, going back to where you're thinking, you know, so there's no termite inspection. You don't even know if there's even walls in the middle oh, um, being held up by sticks. So I don't know. So how do you, how do you go around that when you're, thinking due diligence on the investor side? I can answer that question. Go so ahead. if it's a new investor, Scott's not going to touch it. If it's a contractor that he's been working with, and this is, guy is his own contractor, Scott will let it go. He will let it go through. He has done it for me before, but it takes a lot of trust, a lot of faith, and you've got to have the money to back it up. Scott can also do the 10-day close, which is required and you can actually borrow the money for the auction as well. Yeah. So I can close in, in a week if need be. And like what this goes back to the two that we just closed recently without the appraisals up front, I mean, we got the appraisals after the fact, but if I know who you are in, in the, or I'm dealing with a very experienced and a lot of, some of my clients are some of the bigger builders in the area that you know, their names and you'd be surprised that, you know, they're using private money. It's just, it's just easy. It's, you know, it's not bank underwriting. It doesn't take 45 days for the loan to close. It's common sense underwriting. So if the deal makes sense, we're going to do it. It's, and it's that simple. It really is. So if, in an auction, yeah, it's, it's a gamble. But yeah, if you know what you're doing, and, you, and I know you can overcome any, any mishaps or, or anything overlooked by glancing at the house, then yeah, I'll, I'll fund it. No problem. Well, and that's the other thing we're going to talk about is exit strategies. Because we weren't, we don't have a crystal ball. Like, I'm not a psychic. I don't know what the market is going to look like in three months. I mean, can I make a projection, an educated guess? Yes. Do I think the market is going to crash? No. Also, don't have a magic ball to tell me. So we're going to talk about exit strategy as well for your clients. Because the last thing you want to do is have an invest. Because you get blamed. Investor doesn't want to listen. Buys the bad deal can't get out from under it. I'm dealing with it right now with another investor that I have never worked with before. He did not want to listen to his other agent. They listed it so far over list price. I ended up listing it over $40,000 less than what they thought they could get for it. And it turned out that I had sold a house caddy corner across the street. Um, and they bought one that my big investor looked at and I ran the numbers on it and told him it was a bad deal. And so now I'm trying to get this man out from under this one so that he can buy another one. But. Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you have a client that's giving you, that wants to sell for their dream sales price and they're just not listening to you, you know, it's just like in this case, Chrissy's, I'm a, I'm, 
familiar with this deal. I didn't fund it myself, but nope. <laughs> I'm aware of it. And, you know, this guy was trying to list what, 220? 220. 220, and it's not even close. You know, now he's got to drop, it's 180 all day long. And guess what? He's just dropped it, you know, 40 grand to, yep. to that's the realistic. But he also price. fired his other agent, and his other agent didn't necessarily do anything wrong. His other agent just listed it at the price that this guy yep. wanted it at. Yeah. So, you know, there, I don't have, I have zero. Yeah, you definitely have to be strong and forceful as an agent. Um, yeah. They I mean, a lot of these guys expertise and you better go on ahead and stand your ground. Numbers are numbers. Numbers it, are numbers. Exactly. You, can't, you can't create it out of nowhere to say, sure, we'll go on. You know, when we bought this, I gave you what you could sell it for. Yeah. Now, absolutely. All of a sudden you just gained another 50. Where did that come from? Exactly. You know, what is the appraiser looking for? Like, what is your ARV so for anybody that doesn't? Thing you are when you resale it. So, right. Exactly. You know. the, the only difference is, is like, you know, like with your, with your ARVs, like you're looking at what does this house next door have? What is the new construction around the corner selling for? Can I copy that floor plan? Like, where can I find the value in what do I put into this? What do I advise my client to put into this that is going to make this thing sell? Yeah, comps or comps. So I get a lot of uh, a lot of clients um, that have been for whatever reason turned down, or they just got the runaround from another lender, and they have already have an appraisal done from that lender. And they, you know, the question I get asked is, "Do I need a new appraisal?" And I'm like, "It depends on the appraisal." So send me the appraisal. Comps or comps. Yeah, I, and if they have an appraisal done and it's and it's a it's solid appraisal, yeah, I'm going to use it. You won't need. It need to buy another appraisal can we answer Paper donnie's question up here yeah i was trying to use their ein for the on their business use. i'm not really following the question i don't yeah donnie can you can you rephrase that question are you talking about so, um an investor said he's trying to wait for his ein to come in i guess he's going yep. to try to use his business credit cards to try to get the properties is that even possible? No, no way. No. All right, you That's can't, what, you okay. can't buy no. buy a property on, on a credit card. Now, these trying to use it for materials. Yes, he could use his credit cards to purchase materials, and then when he does the draw, he'll be able to pay off his credit cards. That is what my guys do. They have lines okay. of additional lines of credit. So when they buy their flip, they you know purchase it. Ninety nine percent of the time, they use stock. And then, um, sorry, buddy. <laughs> and, um, and then they use their credit cards and other lines of credit to fund all of the materials and stuff. And then they do the draw and pay off those credit cards and debts so that their um, debt to income ratio isn't affected for the next time around. Now, Scott is really easy to work with when it comes to EIN numbers and stuff. Now, I can tell you for a fact that finance company of America commercial who used to be my guy's hard money lender is so difficult to work with when it comes to an EIN. Um, they continually wanted it in his name, in his personal name, because it was his personal credit, even though his yeah. company was buying it. And we were having to do the paperwork after the fact to title it in the company's name. And the loans were staying in his personal name. Okay. Yeah, so the, re the reason you're bringing up that EIN, whatever lender he's working for is probably asking for that, as well as their LLC docs. And the reason why, you know, private lenders want it in the LLC is because, you know, these are business loans, and we can't do any owner-occupied properties, period, end of story. Okay. I, can do, I can do rentals, um, buy and holds, but I cannot do owner-occupied properties. And that's just one other layer of protection to show – you know, if we ever get audited that, you know, hey, you know, they bought in this business name, it's clearly a business loan. And that's why, just to shed some light on why uh, lenders want LLC uh, made up for the, for the loan. Just FYI. Okay. Yep. We got another slide. Appreciate that. Yep. No problem. All right. There we go. All right, Scott. So ARV, obviously we're going off the, you know, the future value of the property. Uh, that's after repair value is what that means. Um, so when I when I'm crunching numbers with a potential client, you know we're gonna go, you know max, you know I'll use a hundred thousand dollar resale just to keep it simple, 
you know, the max I'm going to loan on that is $70,000. And that has to include your rehab and your purchase. So when I say 70% ARV or 70% of the future value, in that 70%, it needs to include the purchase price and the rehab or rehab amount. So let's say it's more, it's more than 70% ARV and the guy wants to, to buy and hold or, or whatever. He just is, is cool making minimal money. Um, then they just come out of pocket with the difference. So if it's if my ARV is 70,000 on a hundred thousand dollar resale and they, it's really, they need 75, then they just, they're just going to come to the table with the extra 5%. So that's what ARV means. Um, the neighborhood's market time. So, you know, you want to see, you don't want to buy anything. It's going to sit more than 120 days. So you got that again, this comes down to the appraisal and in comps, how quick are they selling? You don't want to, you know, like rural areas. I mean, we'll do them. I'll do a loan in a rural area. Um, you know, it's just going to be 50% LTV because that loan is going to, when they go to resell it, it's going to sit for a while. So oh, it's always key to know what's going on in the neighborhood and the market. And that just translates down to the exit strategy. What is your exit strategy? Do you plan on refinancing? Uh, is this going to be a buy and hold? Um, or is this going to be a flip? So these are all, you know, questions you need to ask yourself on every deal. What is the ARV? What, you know, is it a good neighborhood? How am I going to get out of this if all else, if I can't sell it for some reason? Um, and then I'll let you talk about your list in the house. Yes. So, yep. um, with my investors, when we buy one of these, I, I'm getting the listing. I don't care if they don't get me the, if they don't give me the listing, I will never speak to them again. Um, I don't send potential properties to people that say they're an investor without a buyer broker. I'm not do, like, I'm not doing the work just so they can go off and try to talk to this person directly. Yeah. That goes without saying, you know, if you're finding the property, then you're getting the listing. Yeah. I mean, period. End of story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then of course, is this an Airbnb property? Now we're going to have a class. My next class is in February. Um, and it is going to be on Airbnb. I am bringing in my Airbnb girl. She knows all the rules, the regulations, everything. So there's a lot of things that go into that. Like Newport news and Hampton are, is, is the wild, wild west. There is no rules so far. Um, Portsmouth is a little different. Virginia beach. You can actually get uh, conditional use permits for stuff that's right on the ocean. So there's a couple of fun ways you can do that. Um, as far as your, Oh, here you go. Um, so the questions that you really need to ask them is who's handling the basic repairs. What does their team look like? What is their investment strategy? Do they have a financial goal? What is their network? What does their network look like? If their network isn't good enough, is your network big enough to be able to assist them? You know, where's the property located? Is you know, like Chesapeake doesn't have anywhere that has good Airbnbs. So we, will the rental on a single family home be high enough to carry this if they have to do a refi on it? Um, what is the niche you want to work in? Do you want to do work with flippers? Because I can tell you that they, even the good ones, I have the, one of the best investors I've ever seen in my life and I dearly appreciate him. However, um, um, however, they, um, they do take time. I mean, I pick everything from the paint on the wall to the color of the grout that's going in between the tiles. Heck, Holly picked out the tile for the last one I did. You know, if you guys ever want to design one, let me know. Um, you know, and like, how is their company structured? Like Stacy was speaking about, she had, you know, an investor that was an LLC and it had five people. Who's making the decisions? Who's signing? You know, are they using, are they their own contractor? Does their contractor need to be with them when you show these houses? Are you going to have to show this house three or four times to them to get the other people in there? Because if they do, it's going to be gone before they get there. Yeah. Um, if I may say something, you know, for you guys, I would print this out 
and just make this a checklist whenever you're talking to a potential new investor, because you'll forget to ask some of these questions. And uh, believe me, I've been doing it way too long and I still forget some things. And I have a, my own deal summary sheet that I fill out with every new client. So these, this would be a good one to print out and, yeah. and, and it has a checklist when you're talking to them. Um, also, um, you have to make sure, especially if you're working with a newer investor, that they understand the risks. Okay. We, we as agents, I can try to predict the market as much as I want. It doesn't mean I'm right. Look what happened with COVID. Okay. Who loans started drying up. Everyone pulled out of the market. Blackstone pulled out of the market. That's the one that backs all the, you know, high risk loans. I had a lender pull out of a deal that we were supposed to close on because it was hard money. It, it was a scary time. You know, I was able to save it. But again, you know, I, I think I started losing hair. Um, but when all the loans started going away to a free case went away prices of everything started going up, you know, like for a minute there, there was like a dead standstill. And then all of a sudden everything started to skyrocket and we all got left running to catch up. You know, who would have predicted that outcome? So again, and again, a new client or a new investor, it, it's capital. You, yeah. you, you just need to ask right up front, how much money do you have to work with, you know, for, for problems like we're talking about unforeseen circumstances. Do you have the capital to hold this property? Yeah. Uh, do you have the capital to overcome, you know, a new roof if, if it wasn't caught in the inspection? It is the bottom line, money. 99 answers out of 100 questions, money. Money. You know, like, and again, like, who is their network? Who are they working with? Like, if it's going to be an Airbnb property and they're going to manage it themselves, who's their cleaning company? How are they going to get the things done? Yeah. Who's going to take care of the maintenance? Who's going to do all the bookings? And again, this is where, you know, and if you do, if you guys are, you do, do know contractors or can help them, then again, it goes back to you guys being compensated for that. So it's, I it's have, not. Go ahead. I ask, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. Um, it was was because I'm specifically interested in getting your information, Scott, and um, okay. certainly passing it along to a couple of my other investors that I'm working with, which I have been for a while, is um, first, how many for you to be able to do business with them? Like, again, when we talked about auction, you said, you know, you, you it depends on how many deals, um, you know, they've done. So how many would you say that you would feel comfortable with when you talk about an experienced investor that you'd be willing to work with? One flip. Within most so, recently, like at least yeah. in the past year. So I'm, I'm looking for, you know, I, you know, ideally I'd like to see three or more. Um, okay, absolutely. If they've, if, they've done, been, if they've done once, they've been through the fire. Not, I'm not talking about paint and, you know, paint and trim. I'm talking about a, a yeah, 50, full 000, reno, guts. Yeah, I'm talking about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 rehab. If they've been through that fire, then, then I'm good with that, with one. We're doing okay. one right now that has $125,000 rehab. Yeah, I just I have one now that she literally moved into her own three hundred thousand rehab. <laughs> so yeah, that that happens a lot. I see that a lot. <laughs> yeah, more than more than I should. <laughs> but again, it comes down to exit yeah. strategy. It comes down to the numbers. Like yeah, as long as they're refinancing, uh, you know, it, can they refinance out of this and rent it out? Can they make it work? You know what I mean? Like because right. again. They're just going to turn around and blame you for a bad investment if the market turns. Yeah. And so on that point, you know, we do a background check. We do a credit check because for that reason, you know, we want to make sure, hey, if, if they are like, I, they'll tell me, you know, hey, I plan on moving to, in this place. I'm like, great. You can't occupy it until you refinance us out. So and that goes back to vetting the loan up front. What, you know, What's your what minimal you credit score? 600. So okay. I'm not asking for a lot there. Um, I understand these guys are undercapitalized a lot of times, but that's why we're in business. Um, you know, I understand credit cards, you know, get ran up to, to, to buy materials. So we're just looking for responsible clients. That's all. Great. That's, that's 600. It's not asking, asking a lot. Wonderful. Anything below 600, then they shouldn't be doing this right now. Exactly. They should be putting yeah. the roof over their own head. And, and, and believe me, I get them. I see them all the time. All it's, the time. And it's just a quick no. It's like, hey, man, get it together. Come back in a year or get a partner. 
get a partner that has good credit. And they just have to be 50% of, uh, of the, I'm sorry, they only have to be 20% of the LLC, which is what we require. So okay. if, you, if somebody has bad credit, they have a family member or a friend, whatever, that has good credit, then as long as they're 20, or it's actually 21%. Yeah, it's, it has to be seven hours. Is actually if they're twenty one percent of the LLC that we can use their credit. Well, and don't don't forget that like you cannot advise your clients to purchase a house like a regular house and intend to occupy it when they don't. That is mortgage right. fraud, like plain that's and right. simple. Like absolutely not. No. No, no, no. That's not what her, that's not what happened. Um, they oh no, no, no. I'm not talking about you. They, they fell in love with it after remodeling it. Oh in, yeah, in beautiful historical Smithfield. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But now I'm talking about the you know the ones that come up and they're like, well, I'm going to occupy it, and you know, like, and you know that they're not. That's mortgage fraud. Like, just you don't want to be a part of that. That's right. Yep. It's it doesn't work. It's. You know, if they truly intend to occupy it for a year or more while fixing it up, fine. But if they are like, yeah, sure, I'm going to live in it, like, and then turn around and Airbnb it. There are people from mortgage companies at this point, because there is so much mortgage fraud that actually show up 45 days after you're closing and knock on the front door. Yeah, they will do inspections for that reason. That's how much mortgage fraud is going around right now. You know? They're offering money for turning people in that commit mortgage fraud. Don't do it. Don't be a part of it. Nobody likes it. Yep. Excellent point. <laughs> Anyone got any questions? Even a, even a simple question. There's no such thing as a simple or mm -hmm. a question you may think is stupid um, if you're new to this. So don't hesitate. Yep, and I'm gonna send if everybody puts their email address, I'm gonna actually put my email address in here. I will make sure if I could type, that would be nice, right? Um, I'm gonna make sure that everybody gets a copy of the calculator that I have. And if you want to email me, I'll make sure that you get Scott's information, the calculator that I have, and all of my other accoutrements. Perfect. That have to do with any of this. So that was fun. Thank you. That was hey, very you're, helpful. Hey, you're welcome. I just, you know, I feel so bad for you guys because, like, especially like our newer agents, you know, they're in, not to say that you, you don't know any better, but you keep, you, we get a lot of these opt city leads for investors. And then they waste everyone's time. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it's important to ask these tough questions right up front. Right up front. Just be brutal about it. And if they balk at these questions, they're probably not a real investor. And that goes back to me. The first thing I try to do is kill a deal. And if I can't kill it in five minutes, there's probably a deal there. Same thing with you guys. You need to vet these guys up front. You feel any hesitation or something doesn't, the math's not adding up. Move on. Yep. And if the math doesn't add up immediately and like something doesn't feel right, call Scott, talk it over with him. He'll kill the deal immediately. And then you can go back to this guy and be like, this is not how this works. How's it going? I had um, one, more one guy question. that was uh, looking at going through, um, we were, he was, he was an investor new. He's done it before, but he's going out on his own this time and yeah. whatever, whatever. And I get that. To, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went to the um, a house with him one time and, you know, we're walking around and he's asking me how much, like, I'm, I'm like, how much do you think it would cost for this kitchen to, you know, be, you know, fixed up, you know, like we need to, we need to come up with margins. First of all, he didn't know what a margin was. And then, <laughs> and then we're, you know, he's, he's almost asking me how much I thought it was going to cost. And I was like, okay, do you not this. ever answer any of uh, those I'm glad, questions. I'm glad you brought that up because what I do, um, as I, I try to show up at every house initially one time and walk it with, uh, with the client. And if I find out the client's asking me questions, then that's a problem. You know, they, they need to be telling me what they're going to do Scott. and how they're, and how they're going to do it. 
Scott's Period. lying to you right now. He has never watched one of mine. <laughs> well, no, I'm just on, kidding. The, on the experience, people, no idea. I've walked two years. Okay, uh, okay. I'm not worried about it if you have time experience. I, so I won't. But it, a new client, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just to make sure they, you know, and that's why I asked for comps, even though we're getting our own appraisal. I asked for their comps to make sure they know what they're doing. If they send me some ridiculous comps that um, are just not going to work, then they're immediately called out for give me um, very inflated comps. Yes. Don't not give inflated comps always. Um, and St- Stacy will probably agree with me on this. If I have a comp range of 270 to 300, I'm going to tell my investor that it's 270. Because if the numbers still work at my bottom line ARV, then the numbers work. And if when we, when we get more, everyone's happy. That's right. And that's exactly knowing your market. Don't yep. go on in and be so excited to get the deal and then it'd be a dog at the end. Um, yep, be the first to tell them and be so upfront. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have to be really tough with these guys. A lot of them are contractors. They are rough around the edges. You have got to be able to say it like it is. You cannot look desperate for a client. Like you have got to be tough in these. Jen, is that kw.com or is that lw.com? Is that your email address, Jen? Jen, please check your email address. <laughs> okay, so I can also send you guys the pros and cons list um, that I have that you can go over with somebody that is seriously talking about investing because I have zero problems bringing up a new investor as long as they're willing to do their homework. Scott has zero problems coaching their investor. Uh, coaching a new investor either. So I do have a pros and cons list that I can send to everybody as well. If they would like it, you know, like, do they work a regular job? Are they going to be able to be there? Is, is it you that is going to have to be there? Who's going to meet the contractors? How much work are you going to do for this person? What are you willing to do? What kind of relationship do you want to have with this person? I have one quick question, if I may ask, and this is my own personal for me. So yeah. Let's just say I have, um, because I've been, obviously, I've got some experience um, doing this (laughs) successfully, but only not the financial personal side, but getting it through to the end um, for making money for the investors. Um, So if I got 150,000 equity in my home to tap into that and start as an investor and buy my first property, um, would that be uh, something that, you know, what's my, what's my, what's going to, what am I going to be up against? Uh, you mean you're going to borrow, you're going to borrow against your own on home? My own home on my own home. Yeah. Hey, not, no, no, I put my, I put my phone number in there. I'm actually doing the exact same thing right now, Stacy. If you want to talk about it. Uh, okay. Awesome. Cause yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to pull the, I have the exact same, almost the exact same scenario. So I'm actually getting ready to pull the money out of my own home to buy several rental properties so I can help you walk through that whole thing if you'd like because it's kind of a doozy <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, it's a little bit different um it it takes a while it takes about 45 days and what you're talking about is actually a HELOC yeah um yes. right now um I specifically have a relationship with Blue Ridge Bank and um uh, they, and then um hang on Samantha I, um <clears throat> I specifically have a relationship with them but SunTrust and Bayport actually have the best rates right now as far as HELOCs go. They have the lowest rates, but they also take over 45 days to close. And with a HELOC, you can actually pull out 95% of the value of your home, not the standard 85, because you're pulling a line of credit that is almost like having a credit card. Not So like if you use the money and put it back, it's just sitting there. You're not making that payment. Yeah, I have a client going through it now on her own home, but not for the purpose of what I'm talking about. So I yeah. didn't know HELOC would be an option. Yes, it is. For, that, for, a, for me to say, okay, I'm, I'm doing it as an investment home. Yes, you are, you're literally borrowing against your home and it okay. is a line okay. of credit to be used yeah. as you see fit. It, it's not like a cash out refi where you have to use it to fix your house or whatever. It, right. it can be used however you see fit. Like you want to go buy a car with it, go buy a car with it. It's your money. Right. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yes. I'll definitely be talking to you. <laughs> um, and then Samantha said it. 
Yeah, I had a client or I had an off-sea lead maybe a month or so ago. He contacted me. He's a new investor. And, um, you know, I was asking, you know, do you want to see some houses? And I asked for proof of funds. And he sent me a, a Word document saying that this was my, or he said it was a pre-approval letter. When I looked up the people, they didn't exist. It was a private house. That was the address. The phone number was a landline and um, they didn't answer. And when I asked him for a point of contact, he said to not contact them and to contact these other two friends of his. So yep. always no. just make sure because it wasn't real. Then after you, you, you know, you think about it, you're like, no, he's wholesaling. He just wants to get to the house. And, you know, right. he wasn't, he, had, he couldn't, you know, he had no contractors. He said he was trying to build his team. He was like, you know, just fill them out. But it didn't seem right. I told him, I was like, you know what? I'm not available tonight and never heard from him again. So yeah, I got a point to say about that. So some (laughs) get after it. So Samantha, it's funny (laughs) when you brought that up because on with a new client, if it's somebody I don't know at all on my pre-approval letter, it'll, it'll say, not only will I have my correct contact info, but I'll at the the bottom, please verify, uh, please call or email to verify this letter. So, and why, why I do that is because I see these guys, you know, just like what you guys, you guys get your time wasted. I get my time wasted too. I'll get some investor and I'll be like, yeah, man, I'm ready to do some business and I'll vet them. And then they'll ask for a letter, you know, take my letter and get the, forget the letter and then take the loan elsewhere to friends and family or whatever. So I try to track them for that reason. Um, but yeah, always verify information on, on the letter. Always, always call whatever numbers on there or email, just like you did, Samantha. I mean, yes, always call to verify. If you cannot get a hold of that lender, you need to talk to them and be like, "I cannot get a hold of this lender. Like, who is this person? Like, where is this person?" And if they can't give you that, they're they're not they're not real, you know. And I put an expiration date on my letters too. It's thirty days, so you know, it just helps track what's going on out there um, with, with everybody. Another fun way to get so like especially for like Stacy and you guys and stuff like that. Like, because, you know, like if you've been in it for a while, like, you know, Stacy and I have, um, you do get people that bring you off market stuff. Like again, wholesalers are not always bad. Sometimes they bring you some really fun stuff. It's always worth going to look at. It's always worth bu- building that relationship. However, um, you can call the city and find out all of the houses that are getting ready to be basically repossessed by the city for back taxes. So if you want to find some stuff that's for your investors, that's a good way to do it. You can also get a list of everybody that, um, you know, has a mortgage, but you can get a list of everybody who's getting ready to have their water cut off. They're getting ready to have their water cut off. They probably haven't paid their mortgage, which means that your investor can come in and take over that, which means you'll then get a listing. kind of sneaky but you know <laughs> we got to do what we got to do anybody else got anything else before we go i had i had one question so when you're talking about the draw and it pays off their credit cards or any sort of you know debt that they accrued you know for materials and such what is i guess i think i got confused on what the draw was that you're referring to so it, the draw is simply the money being held for the repairs. So, um, like I said, I, I want to say a minimum of $10,000 worth of work done. So they do $10,000 worth of work and then they give me a heads up. I'll still send them a lien waiver. They sign it, send somebody out there to inspect the work, or I just get pictures from them and then release that $10,000 back to them. So they got to come out of pocket with their first draw, quote unquote, you know, uh, 10,000 bucks and then we reimburse them as soon as $10,000 worth of work is done. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Um, hang on. I'm typing, I'm answering that question. Hang on. Okay. So, so I answered the one, but also the water bills around here, like HRDS and stuff like that, that is all controlled by our city and it's all controlled by stormwater, which is tied into the taxes. So, um, if you call the city, you can get a list of, you know, you could just sound like a good Samaritan. Oh, who's behind on their water bill? Can I get a list of that? And they will give you the list of it. They will give you the list of addresses that have not paid their water bill. Interesting. It's know. public knowledge. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Pay your bills, guys. <laughs> I think it got pushed up too high. Oh, Donnie, 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 what'd you ask? 
Donnie, what'd you ask? Oh, just saying, can you guys do like a quick example? You two, like one of you be the investor, one of you ask the questions, just like if we were to get an investor, what was the common questions you think we should ask to see if they're serious? Okay, Donnie, be the investor. What do you say? Be the investor, Donnie. Give me a phone call. What's up? Oh, how are you doing? I'm an investor looking at a property. Which property are, are you looking at? I'm looking at a property in uh, Newport News, South uh, 100 West Street, right across from Jefferson Avenue. It looks, looks intriguing okay. to me. Um, what kind of, uh, do, are you buying in cash? Are you looking at financing? I'm looking at financing. Um, do you understand that you're going to need at least 20% down? Uh, when you say 20%, 20% of the entire property? 20% of the entire property and 20% of the renovations included a conglomeration of those. Um, so how much is this property? Uh, 150. Okay, so it's 150. How much do you th have you have you gotten to see the property? What would you estimate the property needs in repairs? I would say approximately 50,000 yeah. repairs. Okay. So if it needs 50,000 in repairs, you're going to need at least 20% of $200,000. Do you have $40,000 to put down plus closing costs? I have to get back to you on that one. Yeah, if you're if you're brand new, it's going to be you know, every bit of 20%. That's why, yeah, that's why I wanted to see where I was getting at with new investors. Cause but you don't have to be mean about it. You just have yeah. to rapid start rapid firing questions. And when you start rapid firing questions and know what you're talking about and they start to bulk at it, like, yeah. you, you know, like I'm not trying to be mean and run you off, but at the same time, like if it's somebody who could possibly be an investor, they're going to be able to know, answer your questions. Answer your questions. Okay. Got it. Like, okay, great. Do so. So you're looking at financing, like who are you financing through? I, you know, I've got a guy that can probably get you a better deal. We can probably make these numbers work. Like, talk to me. Like, what, what, what is the plan here? I'd be okay. happy to show you the property, but I'm going to need to know that you can qualify for this property. Cause that's one heck of a drive for me, bud. Gotcha. Yeah. One thing is definitely for sure is that an investor will run you through the tread through the mill and tread exactly. on it there is no doubt but one thing to make sure is so you get that phone call i get them myself hi i hear you deal with investors well listen i'm an investor too can you go look at this property and i'm like i'm not running anywhere exactly. you know until yeah. you actually meet me yeah. meet yes. me for an hour conversation i don't care if it's starbucks next to you yep. bring your paperwork then we'll talk. I am not running around at three dollars okay. a gallon of gas to go check a property out for you until okay. I know you. Correct. And if they're not willing to sign up by our broker, even for that day, we're not doing anything. That's I'm right. not even going to send you a list of potential properties because you're just going to go look them up on the tax record and go direct to the owner. Roger that. That's where I was getting at. I don't. I don't even send. You know, like the. You know, I don't either. Because here's the thing. You can set up an auto email list. They're not going to know what they're looking for, anyways. You have to find you have to find these by hand. Like you have to look at every single property that even comes every close twenty four hours. To look at what's distressed. Every I will say though, you know, if you're an if you're working with an investor, buying a contract owner property that's a whole nother conversation for another meeting. Oh contract yeah, owners. A whole nother animal right there. Yeah. Which is not too bad as long as you have an experienced title company that knows how to do it properly, then it's not necessarily a bad thing because wholesalers are doing the exact same thing we are. You know, yeah. everybody needs to make their piece of the pie. So as long as the numbers still work, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, as long as it, and it, it depends on what contract that person signed also That's right and i would fine. ask to see that right up front you need to see that that contract right up front you need to have an attorney review it before you do anything with that property Thank okay you. guys yep. i think that's about it we went over time so you guys will have so my contact info
Yep, I'll make sure everybody has the, uh, everybody's contact info. I'll send you guys my calculator for doing flips. We're going to do Airbnb next week, or not next week, I'm so sorry. The fourth Thursday of, the last Thursday of February, same time, same place. And we're going to do um, Airbnb. We'll have Nicole um, Pace here who runs Sojourn DC. Um, and we will also, I just, RSVP as fast as you can. Tell me if you're going to be here in person or not, because I have a feeling I might need that big room and I have to like book it way in advance. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Hey, thank you. Thank you.